morning. Today is Thursday, September 3rd, 2009, and this is the start of an interview with Mr. Ron G.S. Navickas at the RSV offices at Catholic Social Services in Macomb. Mr. Navickas is 72 years old. He was born November 3rd, 1936. Mr. Navickas currently resides at 49930 St. Delore Drive, Shelby Township, 48317. My name is Dave Brousseau and I will be the interviewer and Paul Willem will be the videographer. Mr. Navickas, would you now state for the record the branch of service that you were in? I was in the United States Air Force. Okay, let's start at the beginning. Tell us a little bit about yourself, where you were born, where you grew up, where you went to, went to school, and then how did you get into the service? Well, um, I was born in Pontiac, Michigan, as you stated, uh, November 3rd, 1936. Uh, we moved quite a bit when I was young. Uh, of course, we moved to Maryland, we lived in Maryland, we lived in Northern Virginia quite extensively and at the beginning of the war my family moved back to uh, the Detroit area. We went back basically to Pontiac, Michigan. We lived there until 1946 I believe and then we moved to Highland Park, Michigan where I started school, I attended the grade schools, I went to the high school and in 1954, I figured I knew everything there was to know and decided that uh, I no longer needed to be taught anything uh, and struck out on my own. Uh, decided that uh, the United States Air Force could benefit from my knowledge, as limited as it was then. And. Uh, I and three other buddies uh, joined the Air Force at the same time. Uh, where did you have your boot camp? Well, we had to report to Fort Wayne, the old Fort Wayne in downtown Detroit, uh, where we processed through. Uh, we then were transported uh, to Fort Street Station rode the famed Wabash Cannonball to St. Louis, Missouri, transferred there in St. Louis, uh, and went to San Antonio, Texas. And we went to Lackland Air Force Base, where uh, we had 12 weeks of basic training. Uh, during that period of time, I found out that I wasn't as smart as I thought I was. What did it feel like, uh, as opposed to your civilian life, uh, it was more regimented, obviously. We had, uh, we learned to think as one. We, uh, it was a strange, strange feeling to be separated from the family. Of course, when I went in in November, obviously we were there for Christmas. Uh, waking up on Christmas morning and not having uh, the family there was, was a different different aspect altogether. It was uh, it was something I think that that people can't describe. It has to be per person, you know, how they would would go about it. But it was a uh, it was a time that I I really appreciate. I valued it now when I think back on it. When you went in, I, I assume you were still living at home with your folks. Correct. Uh, how big was your family? Uh, at that time, my mother had remarried. Uh, I had a stepfather who he and I didn't see eye to eye, which was partially the reason I went into the service. And I had two younger sisters, and my mother's mother was there, my grandmother, Christy, who I adored. Okay, let's go back to the boot training. Tell me, can you, uh, of the boot training exercises, and experiences, what was that like? Again, it was it was quite unique because we had originally started out as a Michigan flight, meaning that our outfit, a flight, is considered like a platoon. 
our flight was primarily everybody from the state of Michigan. What it evolved into was a mishmash, polyglot, whatever you want to call it, of people from all over the United States. At that time, the Air Force had three training centers because there was such an influx of uh, people joining the Air Force. They had Parks Air Force Base in uh, California, and they had Samson Air Force Base in upstate New York. So these three facilities basically took care of the sections of the United States. Western went to Parks, Eastern went to Sampson, and the central United States primarily went to uh, Lackland in San Antonio, Texas. We ended up with uh, like individuals that were from overloaded outfits, and it was the different personalities were something that was that was unbelievable. You. Uh, you would see the thought process, the, the different uh, terminologies, the, uh, the dialects, even though that we were all you know, from the United States and, and from different states, the different terminologies for creek or crick, and how you'd be ridiculed if you said it to an individual who was from another section of the country. So it was, uh, it was a, a learning process about people and how to cooperate and how to uh, work as, as a one unit, really. Anything do you specifically remember about your training that was hard or something that uh, sparked you on or interesting? No, to obey orders and really obey orders uh, because back in the 50s, uh, there wasn't anything that would govern other than outright brutality. Uh, if you did something wrong, you were penalized. And sometimes you took a boot to the rear end, uh, which I saw quite often. Uh, so a lot of fights. Uh, but again, it was part of, at that time, learning to obey orders and to act and react accordingly. Anything about your training that you found Difficult physical training? No, I think the, the physical training was minimal. I'll put it that way. We, we, were, we marched. We did a lot of calisthenics. We had, uh, I think we marched all over the desert uh, outside of San Antonio. I think I could almost introduce you to every saguaro cactus out there. We marched so much. But... All in all, it was uh, it was something. Again, it was part of uh, creating an individual. When I went in, I was probably 150 pounds soaking wet, and uh, when I I lost weight even when I was in in basic, and uh, but they brought me back up because I wasn't eating junk food then. I was eating basically a ba balanced diet, which I didn't have before. Anything about the heat that you found particularly? It was there in the wintertime. <laughs> and, and Texas is cold. It is cold out in the desert. We had, uh, uh, it would get very hot at, uh, let's say, around new time. But being in Texas and uh, at nighttime, if you were out in the tent, which we weren't only during, uh, during certain types of training, we... Uh, we were pretty well accommodated. I mean, we had the old type of barracks where if you sat there in a barracks, you could hear the wind blowing through the slats. But uh, other than that, it, was, it wasn't it was that difficult. I'll put it that way. It, it was in the mind and the eye of the beholder. I'll put it. At the end of uh, boot training, or your first, what, 12 weeks? Right. Um, did you have any views personally about this uh, alleged police action or politically or otherwise? Well, of course, you know, at that time it was, it was all, basically it was done. Uh, we were on the downside. Everything was being ramped down. We had gotten our nose rubbed in the dirt. Uh, uh, the nation was not too happy with the military. Uh, there was no parades. There was nothing to greet us. We had uh, 
we were now being convinced that our greatest enemy was the great red menace. The Russia was something that we had to, uh, to worry about. And so, to me at the time, the propaganda movement was in effect. We are now switching from, uh, let's say, communist China, we're worried about communist Russia. So, you know, who are you supposed to really be at war with? In terms of a war, there wasn't any. It was the Cold War. So it was hard to discern who we were supposed to hate. And it was almost like George Orwell's 1984. You hate this person or hate that person. But it was, it was something. You know, it's, you had a feeling, and I did. I should say that, and you. But I had the feeling at that time that uh, we had wasted an opportunity. And it was the... The, I can't use the correct terminology, but it was the communication between Washington and Korea. Orders had to be because of one thing as opposed to another, and there was the time lapse. I'm reading a book now called Korea, and it shows exactly how it was handled, and it disgusts me when I think about it now. So you're finishing up basic training. There, there must have been some anticipation about where you were going to go after that. Totally. There was. Uh, it was the unknown factor. Uh, you figure at that time I was uh, 18 years old, um, suddenly aware that I didn't know everything. And I was selected to at one time, I had to go interview for a uh, position. The position was a dental technician, which I found amusing because I had to go and interview between a, a, in front of a full bird colonel. And um, this colonel sat there, and which I, at that time, anything above a captain, I thought was God. And sitting and talking with him, uh, his first question to me was, what do you think a dental technician does? Well, uh, I looked him in the eye and I said, sir, I think that a dental technician assists the dentist. He didn't cut any ice with him. Uh, he asked me another question, that was the end of the interview. And I never got, <laughs> that. I was supposed to be in the Air Force, I had to go to Great Lakes Naval Training Station in Chicago for my tech school if I had been accepted. It didn't work. So there were other menus that I, that I had to search out. We had to go through a, uh, a procedure, and it was called Career Day. And you went in and you took a battery of tests, and these tests were to determine what, whether you could tie your shoelaces or not, I guess. And I had multiple uh, career fields that I was supposedly good for, according to their test results. And uh, none of those that I had showed uh, scores for that were, let's say, good, did I go to. I ended up going to uh, aerial photography school in Denver, Colorado, which was, it was a joy. I thought, oh man, I'm going to be able to be on flight status, I'll be in a flight crew, which I've always wanted to do. And when I finished my 10-day delay en route, reporting to Denver, I found out that the school was closed. And the Air Force said, uh, you can't sit around here and wait until that class opens up, so we're going to assign you where, you want, where we want you to go. In the course of doing that, uh, it said, we have two schools that are open. We have a weapons school and we have a munitions school. And I said, how long is weapons? They said, 12 weeks. And I said, how long is munitions? They said, 11 weeks. I said, give me the uh, munitions school. That's 11 weeks. I want to get out of here. I, I was disappointed. I was disheartened. I was mad because I wanted, I wanted the aerial photography school. And 
As luck would have it, in my 11 weeks of school, I was selected to attend uh, nuclear weapons school, which had been opened up on our base in Lowry. And which meant that that 11 weeks turned into approximately six, seven months that I stayed at that duty station where I started out in a munitions school learning what a 22 blank cartridge looked like and working up to the atomic and hydrogen bomb. How, how long did this training go for the nuclear, thermonuclear training? Uh, that started in June of 1955 and went until October of 1955, where we had to uh, disassemble, reassemble, uh, know every aspect about an atomic weapon as opposed to a hydrogen weapon. We had, uh, we had a clue what we were getting into. Uh, we were in awe constantly of what was in front of us. Uh, obviously, it was they were all inert. They were dummy weapons. But even with that, you know, staring that in the face, looking at something that was now two to three times more powerful than what had been dropped at Hiroshima and Nagasaki, was you were basically dumbstruck. Is this where you got to the point where Security was involved, and you weren't able to discuss any of that? Oh, totally. totally. When I started munitions school, munitions school was, uh, like I said, 11 weeks, which actually turned out to be about 13 or 14 weeks for me because I was pulled out due to security reasons. And uh, it was due to the fact that my mother was born in Canada. And, of course, you had to be lily white in order to, and, and no, no questions should be asked of you. You had to, uh, your security clearance had to be above board. So when I went into munitions, I had a secret clearance. And then uh, once I was cleared, finished my munitions school, I then had to have that escalated to top secret, which uh, was issued, I was accepted, I got my security clearance, I went into school, and once we went into school, you didn't talk about what you were working on, you didn't discuss what outfit, what your outfit was associated with, you were uh, a person who occupied a space. Uh, we were told that if you, me, uh, mentioned it, we were subject to a $100,000 fine, I'm sorry, I exaggerated, a $10,000 fine, which was a lot of money in 55, and uh, 10 years in jail, or both. And of course, uh, the school was separated away from the base, I shouldn't say away from the base, it was uh, segregated on the other side of the base. We had separate barracks that we had to, uh, were billeted in. We had uh, separate types of ID cards and clearance cards to get in and out of school. We had uh, our eyes opened up when we were reading the Denver Post one day and all of a sudden here was a full story on our outfit and what they did, and what that constituted, and exactly what was on the base. And uh, there was hell to pay in our outfit from that. Because then uh, we had uh, OSI, we had, uh, you name every investigating party coming out and questioning who spilled the beans to the newspaper. Never found out. We had, to this day, I haven't a clue who talked. Did. Were there any other repercussions of this? It was a crackdown, yes. Yeah. Uh, after that, uh, you started looking at your partners, and we basically we worked as a, 
when you worked on a, an atomic weapon in those days, you worked as a four-man crew. Um, you started looking at the other individuals saying, you know, did you say something? Or did you? You couldn't have said that. Then you started questioning the other people around you. You know, it, it could have been somebody who just, you know, made a, a flip remark to someone and somebody took that and ran with it. We don't know. Like I say, to this day, I have no idea how the Denver Post got that story, but it was the talk of the base. And I know it wasn't me. <laughs> uh, Pardon me. What about pressure, stress? Did you feel your position brought on additional stress or pressure in your life as opposed to what it would have been otherwise? We did at the time. Uh, I, I think there was there was a glorification because being young, you know, I mean, nothing's going to happen. Um, you, you know, 18, 19 year old kids, <clears throat> pardon me, 18 or 19 year old kids running around and working on nuclear weapons. I mean, who would who would have thought it? Uh, we never gave it a thought because to us they were toys. We were in awe of the fact that our country was in possession of these weapons, but we're working on something that, uh, I mean, it's no different than the tape recorder, or it, it couldn't harm you. We're looking at inert objects. We didn't realize until we sat down and discussed it amongst ourselves and related uh, stories, the witnesses we saw of the nuclear tests, the total annihilation and destruction of uh, mock-up villages and what would happen when these things went off. The stress was something that uh, we became accustomed to, I'll put it that way. We had, uh, I think the biggest thing that bothered, I know it bothered me because I'm quite a blabbermouth, I guess, but the thing that bothered me was we couldn't talk to our families about what we did. Uh, our outfits, the squadrons that we were assigned to, were in, we were segregated from basically everybody. We, our squadron designation was called ADS outfits. We were aviation depot squadrons. Um, when people sat there and said, well, what does ADS stand for? It's Aviation Depot Squadron. Oh, you, you know, you fuel the aircraft, the refueling with, you know, with uh, jet fuel. And we just shake our head, yeah. We couldn't say no. What we do is we do fuel them we, with nuclear fuel. I mean, it's uh, to obliterate anything and everything. But we couldn't talk. Uh, we could only converse amongst ourselves in secure places. There were, there were a lot of things and situations that we found ourselves in after we got assigned to regular outfits that were a lot more stressful. Things that we never anticipated, we didn't even know we were going to get involved in. Where did you go from here now? You went through the training, you get into the actual activities involved with learning about nu nuclear, thermonuclear, uh, where did you go from there? Well, in October, let's put it this way, we, there were only six of us that graduated out of a, a, guys got washed out because they couldn't handle it. Um, we had six members in our graduating class. Uh, one, his name was George Donaldson, great guy. He was a, uh, he was selected to be an instructor at the nuclear school. Uh, there was another kid, and I have a hard time remembering his name. It was Jim Willie or something. He, being at the low end with the last name of W. Willie, he got the choice duty. We never figured that out. Four of us, there was Brady, Hanson, Johnson, and myself, were picked, and I still laugh about it to this day. The four of us were selected to go to the 30, uh, no, 7th ADS 
uh, in Goose Air Base, Labrador. I had a clue where Labrador was. Um, learned geography real quick because I got a map and I found out it was in northeastern Canada and uh, north of Quebec and um, we were, our orders were cut which I tried to get changed real quick. I tried to switch orders with uh, this Jim, this Willie kid I guess and he was going to England well, I had relatives, believe it or not, with the last name of Navicus. I have Scottish relatives that were up in Aberdeen and Glasgow and, and through uh, the British Isles. And I was trying to get my uh, orders changed so I could get over there and go visit some relatives. Didn't happen. I ended up going with uh, the other three guys and uh, we uh, were introduced to the northern climes of North America in December of uh, 1955 when they opened the door of the aircraft and we were in a howling blizzard and got on board a bus to take us to uh, what they call traffic for incoming and outgoing personnel. We got on board the bus and there was a heater that was no bigger than your tape recorder that warmed the feet of the bus driver and we had approximately a half an inch of ice on the inside of the bus. And at that point I went, my God, what have I gotten myself into? Uh, the stress factor started about that time. And uh, it, was, it was a time that, uh, with mixed emotions, I'll put it that way, it was a, uh, 30 below zero weather, uh, which to some people up there was balmy. Uh, we were a split base. We were, the United States Air Force was on one side, on the other side was the uh, Royal Canadian Air Force. We, they were great people. Uh, unfortunately for the outfit that I was stationed and assigned to, the 7th ADS, we were assigned to a SAC outfit. Uh, some people remember SAC. Uh, it's all been downturned now. It's, it's been obliterated. But SAC stood for Strategic Air Command. And our outfit was assigned to the Northeast Air Command. And uh, word was that the base commander had been uh, bounced out of SAC by then General Curtis LeMay. So any SAC outfit was held in very low esteem by the base commander and uh, none of the privileges that other SAC outfits had throughout the world were granted to us. We, we still had to do KP, which SAC never did. We had to, uh, we had to do a number of things and to appease the base commander. But uh, we did have one, what I considered a hero on the base at that time. It was told to me, I never saw the gentleman, I wish I had, I wish I'd have met him and shook his hand. Was, uh, I'm trying to remember his name now, Colonel Paul Tibbetts, uh, who was the uh, uh, air pilot, aircraft commander, I believe, of the Enola Gate. And to the Air Force, in their infinite wisdom, I, from what I was told, had decided that they were going to uh, primarily isolate him and his family from the news media up in Labrador. And he was, he was I don't know if he ever held a position other than just being assigned up there to some mundane duty. I, I have a clue. But uh, our outfit, at that time when we got there in December uh, was a uh, it was a tough outfit. These guys, they knew their job. We were, the three of us, or four of us that were going in, well, I was, I think all, all four of us at that time were airmen seconds would be, they were two stripers in those days, now everything's 
rearranged. I have no idea what classification that would be now. But the four of us coming in were nurse-mated from the time our feet hit the goose until the guys we replaced left. And we replaced three master sergeants, those we lovingly refer to as zebras. They had six stripes and a tech sergeant, which was five stripes. Uh, those four guys were old timers who had been around since the inception of the nuclear program. We replaced them and it was, it was funny to see these four old codgers leaving because they were going home. Our tour of duty was for one year and uh, you had the option of extending if you wanted to and there were times when there was there was guys up there. It was it, if once you become acclimated, once you primarily knew what was it ex, you know expected of you, what your duty assignment were, and you carried it out. Uh, there were individuals who extended, who stayed there. Uh, there were some individuals who couldn't leave because they couldn't find replacements for them because of the career field. There were people who couldn't uh, who couldn't do the job. So it was, like I say, it was a learning experience and the stress started when we got, got to the base. Did you continue your nuclear activities? Totally. Uh, what, what did that involve? Well, working on an atomic weapon was entirely different. It was a, it was a situation where uh, we had to perform periodic maintenance on it. We had a, a, what we call the plant. The plant consisted of a huge, uh, it would be called a, a blast igloo. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with it. You've, you've probably seen them in a number of places. Uh, they are, it's a mound in the ground. It's, it's, it looks like a, a, a grassy Quonset hut. And on both ends of the building are huge, concrete walls. Opposed from the doors are again two huge concrete walls and with grass and dirt backing mounds behind them. This plant that we worked in was uh, basically kept warm. I mean we had our own heat uh, during the winter time when 40, 50 below zero. But we were under the earth and when they would bring a weapon in, we, would, we couldn't touch the weapon right away. If you did, you left your hand or the skin of your hands on the, uh, on the metal. The weapons were, uh, we had to open the, what we would call, we would sweat them out. And there were three panels that had to be taken off of an atomic weapon. And at that time, we worked on a weapon that was uh, a Mark VI, Boy, am I pulling this out of nowhere. A Mark VI Mod 4, meaning it was the fourth modification of a Mark VI weapon. When we left, when I left the base in 1957, that weapon had been modified two more times and we were up to a Mark VI Mod 6 uh, to increase uh, the operability to increase the destructive power. Obviously. When you, when you say um, weapon, the bomb. Ah, so this isn't things soldiers take with them in the form of weapons. It's no, none a, whatsoever. Another modification of the original bomb going on. Exactly. This this weapon. Uh, there were two types of weapons in those days. There was an AEC weapon, and there was a uh, DOD weapon. AEC meant it was Atomic Energy Commission. Uh, DOD was Department of Defense. Um, there were numerous records kept on each and every weapon that was in stock, in store. Uh, we had hydrogen weapons that were there. We never, and this was the thing that stunned me, we never worked, we had one weapon we used for training. But the rest of the hydrogen weapons were never, and I, to this day I have no idea why, were never broken out. Um, 
I don't even know if they existed. We were told they were there. I never saw them. But when I refer to a weapon, I mean the bomb, the ordnance. Uh, this was something that uh, a Mark VI Mod 6 weapon would probably take up a good portion of this room. And uh, it was, if you see any of the old movies of when they dropped the bomb on uh, Hiroshima or Hiroshima, it was similar in shape and size to that. Uh, the configuration was very close to it. It was a uh, awesome ordinance, I'll put it that way. Well, you're talking about a 10 by 20 room. That's pretty big. Well, think, think of this. These had to be hauled around on four-wheel carts, and they had to be pulled by a, uh, a tug. And when, again, when I said when they were brought into what we called the plant, uh, we had to open it up so that we'd warm up before we could work on it. Uh, the condensation, uh, even though it was aluminum, the what they call the sphere that held the explosives, that was basically all aluminum. Uh, this, you could see the moisture coming out just from the heat. I would say that the weapon, God, it was probably... <laughs> Fifteen feet, fifteen twenty feet long. I, I can't. I can't even fathom a guess on it right now. I do know that when I stood next to it, I couldn't see over the top of it, and that's being when it was on its uh, dolly. Um, one of the jobs that we had on that after opening it up and after the it got to room temperature that we were, it was safe to touch it. We had to remove what they called detonators, uh, which was a two-man job. Um, you would go around, you would make, uh, disconnect all electrical leads to the detonator, uh, remove each and every one, counting for every one. You would put them into a case, making sure that you had the right amount uh, another member of labor, like I said, there were four-man teams. Uh, what it ended up doing was that um, two men would have what they called uh, rails. They would open up the back of the weapon and crawl up inside. And uh, getting into it was like going through uh, a small manhole cover. You would then put these rails in and they would a line underneath what they call the spherical ring. The spherical ring held, <clears throat> pardon me, all of the electrical wires uh, for the weapon to go to the detonators. This was something that you had to go up inside. You had to remove this ring and it had to be brought out onto the rails, put onto a cart, and taken over to another portion called uh, electrical bay. We had eBay and M-Bay. M-Bay obviously meant mechanical bay. Uh, then the job for one of the individuals, one of the team members, would be to go up inside, disconnect the, the detonators, hand them out, because that was high explosives. And you would perform all your maintenance, go through, do your periodic maintenance on every, every bit of the weapon, and then uh, crew chief would come around, you'd, look at your check sheets to make sure everything was done, everything was in order, that nobody had screwed up, because if you did, that blast igloo would do exactly what it was told, you know, built to do, and would roll the blast back. Uh, one thing, the first thing, and I forgot to mention this, when that weapon came in, because of the low humidity, almost non-existent humidity, even though you, the weapon was sweating, you made sure that that weapon was grounded. No sparks. You had no uh, cigarette lighters. You had no flame whatsoever. No matches were allowed anywhere in our plant or basically inside our area. And our area consisted of probably a couple hundred acres because of the high explosives that were around. 
which again added to the stress. It was, it was there constantly. How much do you think that thing weighed? I wish you hadn't asked me that question because I really don't remember. Uh, that was part of it. I could probably go on Wikipedia and find out they've got everything on that, but uh, I would say it was maybe a ton. Now, it seems to me this was the Cold War period. Correct. And if I recall, we had B-52s in the air all the time, rotating? Uh, that was that was towards the end. We had, uh, I'd be honest the truth with you, when being up there in Labrador, we were a support base for aircraft, for, for crews coming from the United States, going over to what they used to do, they just have TDY, temporary duty assignments. They would come from various bases in the States, land at our base, uh, Depending on what the work order was, they would might, they might have a weapon on board. Mm -hmm. They would download the weapon, and we would perform maintenance on it. That weapon would either we would keep that weapon, or a weapon would be brought out of storage and would be assigned to them, and they would take that weapon and then fly on to Europe or North Africa, wherever. Because at that time, we had bases. There were SAC bases throughout the world, uh, primarily, and there were SAC bases in. Uh, Spain, uh, France had uh, kicked us out, um, England, and North Africa. They were in Morocco, uh, Libya, and I forget where else. And our base at that time, like I said, was support. What we ended up doing was uh, watching aircraft, various types of aircraft. And at that time, we would get uh, B-47s coming in, which was a uh, medium bomber three-man crew, but uh, we had B-36 would come in. That was the biggest uh, aircraft I had ever seen. And it would come in and we would uh, we would work on it. The B-52 came in probably around 1956. The first one came in because we were the support base for, uh, I think it was, um, it was a base in, in Maine. I think it was called Limestone Air Force Base. And we were alternate for them in case they got weathered in. And to them, it was just a hop, skip, and a jump down the road. But uh, the first 52s we saw come in. And we didn't realize, when you were talking about and asked the question about the Cold War, we didn't realize what we were involved in until the Hungarian Revolt. And then our base couldn't hold. People don't realize how close we came to nuclear war during the Hungarian Revolt. We had every conceivable aircraft in the Air Force inventory for strategic air command at that time on our base. Uh, our flight line and parking area was just... Uh, it looked like Metro Airport with aircraft coming in and taking off every couple minutes. Uh, it, it was something that we hadn't experienced and something that we didn't know until we heard of what was taking place in Europe at that time. And uh, when all was said and done, we didn't realize that we had expended all of our inventory of atomic weapons. They had all gone to Europe. And as they ramped down, as the Hungarian revolt, supposedly, uh, started to diminish, the aircraft were recalled and our stock was put back in order. But that was, that was a time that was, uh, we, were, we were on alert for a problem, I would say, a good month that we were working around the clock, uh, winter time, we saw uh, we saw guys coming, I mean, totally, the guys just beat physically and, and mentally beat because of operations that had to be carried on. And uh, then we realized, you know, what 
what some guys really had to go through. Thank God we never had to go through the war. But uh, it was it was an eye-opening experience at that time. Now, correct me if I'm wrong. It seems to me that although the weapons had explosives, they were typically armed in flight on a way to a mission. Correct. So that technically they weren't armed when they were on a base or even in the airplane, but only armed at a point when they were ready to be uh, released. No, that's totally correct. Uh, outside the continental, continental limits of the United States, they could be what they called uh, the capsule. I think that's, I can't remember all the terminologies, but I think it was the capsule could be inserted into the weapon, but only at the discretion of uh, the aircraft commander or the pilot or what orders they were given. And it had to, uh, it had, in order to do that, there was a, uh, a device, and it was an arming device that was placed inside. They would have to remove a front cover and switch it. And when they switched it, it would be a red, or it would be red, and it would have R. I'm sorry, A for arm. When it was over on safe, it would have green, and it would have a white S. And you would you could set this in the front. Hold that thought for just a second. And that uh, when they had that inserted, then it would have been a nuclear explosion at that time. I have no idea what the, the new ones are today, but you're correct in, in that statement that yes, uh, that was the only time that they would have a capsule inserted. And uh, if it did go off on the ground, within the uh, continental limits of the United States, it would what they call a low order detonation. There were still explosions, but it's just not. All right, I want to take a few, few minutes here to talk about your social life. Uh, how, how did you stay in touch with your family? Uh, I was very poor. I always wanted letters, but I didn't want to write them. Uh, there wasn't much to write about when I was overseas. I mean, uh, we had the Sitka spruce with trees all over. I mean, it's uh, if you've ever been to Alaska, um, it's easier to see what's in Alaska than it was in a laboratory because there isn't too many tour companies going there. But uh, when you're talking about snow, you can only explain snow to a certain extent, and then you know what snow is. Uh, there was no towns to visit when I was in Labrador. And when I rotated back, uh, I was just too darn busy. But boy, I wanted them to write me and let me know. You know I was lazy when it mm. came to writing. How about the food? They took care of us. They took care of us. They, uh, we had situations where we, were, we had a blizzard hit. And uh, we were snowed in. For two weeks, we couldn't get mail, we couldn't get packages. We had a lot of situations where uh, fights broke out, tensions, stress again, because uh, of the, the climate, what uh, Mother Nature threw a curve at us. Uh, mm -hmm. We had probably, we had two-story barracks in it. We had snow, maybe about a foot below the uh, second story windows. The food in the chow hall then diminished back down to about K rations. We had uh, dehydrated potatoes, which uh, I don't know if you've ever chewed on dice before, but about the same <laughs> consistency. Uh, powdered milk, we, we had that all the time. We ate uh, so I, I was I was grateful to get any food to tell you the truth, but the most amazing thing was uh, we noticed immediately the difference in the eggs. Uh, the eggs were like library paste, and we had sausage that was uh, came in sheets, 
And the only way I could describe it, it would be like uh, a kid taking apart a toy in, out of a package. You would break off the sausage, which I found was rather humorous. But uh, they fed us. They, uh, they did everything possible that uh, they could keep us going. In fact, we would burn energy so fast in the cold weather that uh, it was not uncommon for people to go to uh, midnight chow. You would have, you would go and have four meals a day and never gain a pound. Was there anything in the service that gave you skills to prepare you for your life after the service? Not a thing. Uh, there was nobody when I got out of the service that wanted me to repair their atomic bomb or their hydrogen bomb. I looked all over, but there weren't any want, ad, uh, want ads for nuclear mechanics, uh, or thermonuclear mechanics for that fact. Uh, when I got out, uh, I got out as, because I was a veteran, <laughs> I couldn't draw an employment because I was given $300 mustering out pay. Uh, I don't know. I, I sat there and I thought about it, and I still think about it to this day. Uh, I have a bad taste in my mouth with the VA and how they treated their veterans. Uh, still do. Uh, but when I got back to civilian life, uh, it was uh, scrounge. Do what you can to stay alive. And uh, my military training, like I say, there was the only thing it taught me to do was survive. And they did a great job in that. Couldn't ask for more. What'd you end up doing? Uh, you name it. I've done, uh, I was an armored car messenger. Uh, I transported valuables and government funds from here to there. Owned my own business in Florida with a partner. Uh, met and married my wife in Fort Lauderdale. Had to go all the way to Florida to meet a girl from Six Mile Gratiot area in, in Detroit, <laughs> and me being from Highland Park. I had, uh, coming back here, I went to work for government contractors. During uh, Operation Desert Storm, I worked for the government. And my I retired in 1998 from a government contracting job, and I decided that I'm not going to work anymore. I just I figured I've done my time and I'm going to sit back and reap the rewards. And I got a phone call in uh, 2004 from a gentleman and asking me if I wanted to go back to work. I, he made me an offer I couldn't refuse and I went back as a uh, consultant to the U.S. Army TACOM and uh, worked there until 2007 when I figured that uh, I had taken enough of the government's money and the taxpayers' money and decided to re-retire. Hmm. So it's, uh, it's, it was an enjoyable time in the military, one that uh, humorous things that happened. Uh, in fact, I went online about two, maybe three weeks ago and came across a name that I had been searching for for probably over 40 years. And at, just for a whim, I sent a note to this person. And uh, it was originally from Perth Amboy, New Jersey, a buddy of mine that I'd been stationed with when I got to Kansas. And lo and behold, it was him. Mm. And he called me on the phone, and we sat there and talked about anything and everything you can imagine. I mean, after 40 some odd years, it's amazing what you remember, just like this here, what you remember. Anything else you'd like to share with us? Oh, I could probably burn up about another at least three hours, but uh, there's other individuals who have a lot more to say than I do. But I, I want to thank you folks for doing what you're doing. Well, thank you for coming in and sharing what you had to tell us. You're very welcome. Thank, thank you very welcome. much. Thanks, Dave. Appreciate it.